You see, we're a little bit under construction. Why? Because we're actually building a new Christian Fitness set for all of our future shows. Here's a pretty cool little 3D rendering of what it's going to look like when it's all done. Hi, I'm Rachel Mark, and here at WHTN, the Middle Tennessee Christian Television Network affiliate. Here at CTN, the sole purpose has always been to save souls. The Believer's Voice of Victory Network is your source for consistent Word of Faith teaching. No matter where you are in the world, you can be encouraged through these faith-building messages 24 hours a day. You can watch the Believer's Voice of Victory Network on DISH, channel 265. I remember one meeting, and uh, brothers from the both sides, they were arguing their point, and they got so riled up, one actually reached up and went like this over the table. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans, and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker. And in this video, I want to talk about televangelism, specifically the seeming slide of the Jehovah's Witness leadership into televangelism, despite being largely against it in past decades. Now, what prompted me to address this subject was the recent news in the Times Herald Record, which was confirmed on JW.org in summarizing the announcements made at the 2019 annual meeting that Jehovah's Witnesses are building an enormous media production center in Ramapo, New York. The article says the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society announced plans to build an enormous audio-visual production center on land partly in Tuxedo, but mostly in Ramapo. Members of the non-profit group, better known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, plan to use the building to consolidate and expand various multimedia production offices, which they say make materials about living a principled life. The new 1.5 million square foot facility would be almost as big as the Jehovah's Witnesses' 1.6 million square foot headquarters, located two miles away in the town of Warwick. As in Warwick, roughly 1,000 volunteers would live and staff the Ramapo Media Production Centre. Now, what most intrigued me about this article were several things that were said by an actual spokesman of Watchtower. So it says, Robert Zick, a Jehovah's Witnesses spokesman, estimated it would take two years for the group to finish planning the project and up to another four to build the complex. Zick was not readily able to say why the project had a six-year timeline, but he said the biodiverse nature of the site might make it complex to develop. Now, this interested me because we're talking about something that's only going to be up and running, apparently, six years from now in 2026 and yet you can almost bet in fact i would bet money on once this center is up and running watchtower saying something like only with jehovah's hand could it be possible that we would create these facilities completely overlooking the fact that they're doing it within an actually very generous time scale and that people can build pretty much anything when they have when they're allowing themselves so much time the article also says zick declined to put a price tag on the complex which would merge the jehovah's witnesses disparate media production offices near the hamlet of wallkill and in the town of tuxedo and patterson among other locations when Zick is declining to put a price tag. I think that's deliberate. I And we see this time and time again whenever new construction projects are being reported in the media. They won't give price tags. The media actually has to do that for them usually by giving estimates. But they don't give price tags. And the reason is because if Watchtower starts throwing around massive sums, oh, our media production centre is going to cost us this many, 100 million or whatever, they know that witnesses are going to read that and think, oh, well, <laughs> if you've got that much money to spend, maybe, maybe my $10 donation 
per month is now going to become a $5 donation per month. I think that's a deliberate thing that they're doing, withholding that information, and it seems quite disingenuous to me. And finally, I wanted to draw your attention to elsewhere in the article where it says, he said that Zik, the Jehovah's Witnesses, have seen a swell of outside interest from the general public in some of the group's audio-visual advice materials, including videos offering parenting advice. And later on it says, we're ramping up production in response to heavy demand of audio-visual offerings, Zick said. People find these materials to be useful, so we're putting more resources behind them and we're putting everything under one roof. This again is disingenuous, because if Zick really wants us to believe that there's this surge of interest in Jehovah's Witness propaganda materials from non-Jehovah's Witnesses, which is what he's leading this reporter to believe, where's his evidence? Where are his figures? Show us where this interest is. As far as I'm aware, Jehovah's Witness video materials that you find on their website, they're made purely for believers, or predominantly, you could say, for believers. And they are made to increase the stranglehold that the organization has on the minds of believers, to keep them indoctrinated. And in a short while, I'm going to be showing you some leaked footage that supports what I'm saying there. And we'll get to that. But I'm I'm making this video about the slide into televangelism. So it's worth just... And what I'm trying to do is give you more of a background to where this is going. So we have these new facilities that we can look forward to in 2026 in Ramapo. This was announced, as I mentioned, at the annual meeting on JW.org. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you might be saying, well, there's nothing new here, Lloyd, when it comes to the use of visual media in getting the, the message out about Jehovah's Witness teachings. What about the photo drama of creation? All the way back in 1914, you had Watchtower's founder, Charles Taze Russell, getting in front of the camera when there barely were cameras, sharing the good news in front of cinema audiences at a time when cinema was cutting-edge technology. And I would agree with you. Um, I don't think that the photo drama of creation, if you actually bother to watch it... <laughs> is something that witnesses can necessarily be proud of. And it's difficult to watch it, by the way, because it's eight hours long. And it includes some very backwards ideas that scientists would be scratching their heads at if they were to actually hear what was said in that particular film. But I accept that you have a film at the outset of the organisation, and this has been followed by other films, albeit over considerable spans of time. So in 1954, you had the New World Society in Action, a black and white, you could say, infomercial documentary style film about goings on at World Headquarters. At his desk, the Society's president, Brother Knorr, gives his secretary, Brother Henschel, some dictaphone recordings with letters of Christian instruction for the Society's branches. You also had in 1990, and I remember this as a child, the film Jehovah's Witnesses, the organization behind the name. I can remember being enthralled by this film. It, w it felt like for the first time I could actually see the organization that I was reading about in the literature. And there it was in full color. And I was captivated by these images of moving machinery and people assembling cardboard boxes really quickly. I 
was enthralled by it. And since then, there have been multiple individual features. So I have here a number of uh, DVDs with some of these features. This is a DVD um, with, uh, well, it's titled The Bible, A Book of Fact and Prophecy. I think there might be a couple of films on this. I'm not too sure, but this is um, a film that Watchtower made to basically promote the authenticity of the Bible. You also have uh, some videos on this DVD, Trans Transfusion Alternative. So this is obviously promoting Watchtower's no blood stance. <laughs> you have this rather cringeworthy DVD. Young people ask, what will I do with my life? You have, oh, good grief, we're going to come to this. <laughs> Uh, you had this DVD, uh, Noah and David. The Bible, in Genesis chapter 6, tells us that many years ago, about 600 years after the first man, Adam, died, some angels looked down from heaven upon the earth and noticed the women. So that was an early attempt at, I don't know, indoctrinating children with some pretty... How can I put it? Some pretty primitive attempts at trying to master animation. And you also have this DVD. What's the date on this? 2006. Jehovah's Witnesses organized to share the good news, which was really, I think, more of an update to the organization behind the name. But the point is, they've, they've made feature videos. You could say increasingly moving into let's say the 90s and what would you call them noughties the two <laughs> the 2000s they've made these feature films but you can't really call that televangelism nor can you really call the photodrama of creation televangelism these are standalone feature films that watchtower has produced JW Broadcasting, however, is very different. JW Broadcasting is every single month we're going to present a show. And this show is going to be aimed at strengthening your faith, or you could say coercing and manipulating people with some very emotional, heart-tugging, tear-jerking material, including heart-wrenching personal testimonies, that kind of thing. This is more, we're getting more into the realm of what could be described as television, albeit internet television. And they even have on the website the opportunity to stream JW Broadcasting so that you can turn on your telly and something will be playing continuously, even if it's just dredging up older episodes. That's very different, I would suggest, from the photodrama of creation and these standalone videos that they've produced, which again only really began sort of in the 90s and early 2000s. Now, at this point you might be asking, okay Lloyd, we get it. There's this slide into what could be construed as televangelism. What's the big deal? Why is this something that we need to talk about? Well, because the organization time and time again in its literature has condemned televangelism when it's being done by other denominations or other people. Basically, no one else gets to do it but them, if you actually read the literature. And I have some quotes lined up for you. Probably the most interesting one goes all the way back to an Awake article in 1981, March 22nd. And I would, I would urge you to read the whole thing. Not all of it, you could say, is applicable to JW Broadcasting because although they certainly have used JW Broadcasting to try and get money, as they famously did in, I think, the May 2015 episode when Stephen Lett basically held his hand out and said, look, we've overspent, we need you to, you know, stump up some money. They haven't kind of, and they do every now and then say, you know, we can support Jehovah by giving donations. It's not quite the same as your typical uh, televangelist channel 
where they're giving you credit card, you know, here's how you pay by credit card and here's the number you need to call. It's not quite the same, so I accept that. But even so, if you read the 1981 Awake article, there are some very interesting parallels with what we see today. So I'm just going to read you one or two bits. The article opens by saying, The preacher wears no black robes. Instead, he glistens in a three-piece white polyester suit. He presides over no altar, but roams over the multi-level stage of his television cathedral, bathed in Klieg lights. Polished to a mirror finish, with every step outlined in flashing lights and numerous backdrops constantly changing the scene, the stage itself seems to be the star of the show. And that's not all, there's more. Further on it says, most religious broadcasters could never compete with regular network programming for the America mass audience. When a religious program comes on TV, most people, bluntly put, turn it off. The problem for the electric church is how can they reach the dedicated minority of viewers who want to watch religious programs? The answer? Revolutions in satellite technology, breakthroughs in computer applications, and the advent of cable TV systems and new over-the-air stations are turning the US into a global village and making it economical to narrowcast to a relative handful of supporters, as Forbes magazine points out. So what if not everyone wants to catch a religious programme? TV, like magazines, can now cater to specialised audiences. The result is a different economics for the electric church. The viewers do not support these programmes indirectly by purchasing soap flakes that have been advertised on the show. Instead, they must support the programmes directly with their contributions. So again, astonishing echoes, really, of what we're actually seeing now in the 21st century, decades after this was written. Watchtower has become the very thing, you could argue, that it was complaining about here in 1981, but there have been more quotes since then. There's a quote from a 1984 Watchtower. This is the August 15th issue, pages 17 and 18. But from where did Jesus get all those things that he taught? Why was he so successful in his ministry? Did he, like modern TV preachers, use exaggerated emotion to sway his audience. No, Jesus' basis was simplicity itself. He spoke the language of the common people. He was aware of their spiritual needs. And most important of all, Jesus knew he had his father's backing. So complaining there about trying to sway people emotionally with video output well, that's exactly <laughs> what they're doing now. Another quote from the 1988 Watchtower, April 1st, page 17. Now, in the age of television, we have TV preachers exploiting the medium with every kind of theatrical trick and psychological device to beguile the masses and empty the pockets of the flock. How appropriate is Jeremiah's denunciation even now, some 2,600 years later? For from the least one of them, even to the greatest one of them, every one is making for himself unjust gain. And from the prophets, even to the priest, each one is acting falsely. At the same time, none of them want to accept the challenge of the true Christian ministry. Face to face with the people from house to house. So this quote appears to be saying, look, the only way of doing ministry is house to house. So let's not fall for this idea that you can do your ministry by getting in front of a camera. That's basically what this quote is saying. Again, how could they possibly get away with saying that sort of thing now? Another quote for you in the 1989 Watchtower, May 1st, page 5. 
True, religion still seems to prosper in the United States, where a more emotional sector of the populace is exploited by TV evangelists and religious psychologists. Yet, even some of these materialistic charlatans have recently been unmasked and disgraced. So apparently, TV evangelists were materialistic charlatans, so long as they weren't Jehovah's Witness TV evangelists. And the final quote for you here from a 1995 Watchtower, March 1st, page 9. Swayed by sensational oratory, some pour their hard-earned money into the pockets of TV evangelists in wholehearted support that amounts to devotion. So these were just a few. There were actually more that I've not included here. If you want to do your own research on this, go on Watchtower Online Library, type in any combination of TV and preacher or TV and evangelist or televangelist, and there's no shortage of material that is, for the most part, entirely condemning this practice of basically preaching in front of a camera Again, here we are in 2019, or it's been going, JW Broadcasting, since 2014, and it's a whole different picture entirely, which is why I can imagine for many of the older generation of Jehovah's Witness who can remember these sorts of quotes, again, you did have the occasional video coming out, but it wasn't TV, it was a video. I can remember going to Patterson in, let me see, 2003. And it was a little bit embarrassing because we visited, we went to part of the complex where there was this building and the guy said, oh, that's where we shoot our videos. And dad made this joke, typical sort of dad joke. Oh, you mean like Hollywood? <laughs> And little could I have known, little could Dad have known, little could the guy have known that what began as this kind of building tucked away at Patterson almost as an afterthought would later become this proposed sprawling mass of TV studios that would rival in size um, or nearly be the same size as the headquarters itself. So quite astonishing, really, this how we've gone from utter condemnation to actually we'll have a piece of that. Now, that's essentially the slide into televangelism. But when I was planning this video, it reminded me of a leaked video that we received at JW Survey that I never actually got round to covering on the channel. I watched it, I watched parts of it, and there were, I thought, hmm, it's a, it's a bit interesting, this, but it's not as interesting as some of the other stuff that we're getting through, such as Pillowgate, etc., etc. So it kind of got a bit forgotten. Um, but this whole news about Ramapo made me think, I think I'm going to watch that again. And I watched it all the way through, and there was some fascinating stuff that was said. And rather than play you the whole thing, I'm going to show you the interesting parts. Bear in mind, I can't release the whole thing without commentary anyway, because I would be in breach of copyright. But I can show you the most interesting parts with my commentary, and then I'm not in breach of copyright. So this is a meeting of the AVS department, the Audio Video services department and this meeting is held at Mount Ebo in February of 2017 so this is an old video we've clearly moved on at least somewhat since the way things were for Watchtower back in February 2017 but it's fascinating to see Watchtower explaining its attitude towards videos and some of its perceived achievements, and even going a little bit into the history at this special meeting at the what was then the newly opened 
Mount Ebo complex. And this meeting was attended by the teaching committee of the governing body. So you have several governing body members in attendance, including Geoffrey Jackson, Tony Morris and Stephen Lett. And of those three governing body members, Stephen Lett gives a talk, which again is fascinating in putting this whole conversation about televangelism into its proper context. So I think I've set the scene. Without further ado, let's roll the first clip. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, there are 16 men and women of faith that are mentioned. And we know them very well. We've been studying them for years. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. And then Paul continues in verse 32 after naming them and all their wonderful qualities. He said, and what more will I say? For a time will fail me if I go on to relate about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the other prophets. And of course, he went on to say the best most awesome example is Jesus Christ. And then there were those who were unnamed servants of Jehovah who endured much. But what did all of these faithful servants of Jehovah have in common? They were faithful. They relied on Jehovah. So what did all of these faithful servants have in common? They were faithful? <laughs> so this is Ron Curzon talking a governing body helper who I have referred to as Robo Ron because when he presents JW Broadcasting he usually does it in quite a robotic way. What we're seeing here though is a fairly more animated natural conversation because he's talking to fellow Bethelites. He's not talking to ordinary Jehovah's Witness rank and file and rather than interrupt him too much more let's continue with what he's talking about. They had the courage to do what no man or woman would normally be able to do. It was power beyond what was normal. Each one has something in common with you and with me. We have the same Holy Spirit to tap into. In fact, there were times when these servants that I just mentioned received an assignment or a mission and they said, no way, it's impossible. In fact, they might have viewed it as mission impossible. But we know what Jesus said at Mark 10, 27, he said, with men it is impossible, but not so with God, for all things are possible with God. And then humbled Job, finally had to admit to Jehovah in Job 42, 2, now I know that you are able to do all things and that nothing you have in mind to do is impossible for you. So by means of Jehovah's powerful Holy Spirit, what was impossible became possible. It became commission impossible for all those listed in Hebrews chapter 11. Commission impossible. <laughs> Good grief. So <laughs> I wanted to include this. This doesn't really tell us anything sensational about televangelism. I've included this more because it's interesting to see how the tone changes and the style of the information changes when again it's a behind closed doors meeting there's no way they would Ron Curzon would be saying this sort of thing I, I would imagine <laughs> I've learned that nothing should surprise me anymore but I would suggest it's very unlikely that he would be referencing shows like Mission Impossible in a JW broadcasting episode this is more a behind closed doors meeting so he clearly feels more comfortable in making that sort of reference. As you know, we need people to be actors and actresses. So we have to try to use them uh, to the best of their abilities in videos and even their voices for audio. And we need auditions. So we want to see how they do and where they could be used. Uh, this uh, casting is then done to see what roles that we can use them in. And then after that, once we identify them, then there's training with the characters to have them act naturally in front of the camera. Easier said than done. But they have done an outstanding job to make it realistic and authentic. Note what some of the things that they have accomplished in 2016 for the audition team. 
there were 1,655 auditions performed here in New York area, as well as 185 auditions in Mira Loma, California, with our very qualified teams of brothers and sisters out there. When it comes to casting, uh, from the auditions library, the total number of cast members invited in 2016 was 2,224. Can you believe that? Over 2,000 were auditioned and brought in as cast members. So acting classes. Of these 2,224 people that were cast, we sent 218 people uh, through an acting class and that made them more natural, how to uh, deal with the camera and, and their nerves and to be natural. In fact, uh, an experience that we received back was a sister that we cast and we ran her through this uh, acting class and her name was Mary. And she revealed that shortly after we called her to use her in one of our videos, that she was also approached by someone in the world who was a producer to be used uh, in uh, a movie. And so she had a decision. And what was interesting is that she was called to be used on the same day by two different entities, Jehovah's Organization and you know the other. What decision did she make? She knew this probably wasn't a coincidence. Satan doesn't want us to do more for Jehovah, less. Well, she decided that she would stick with her uh, heart and stay with Jehovah's Organization and be used uh, in that particular video. So we're real proud of our sister. and those who were helping with auditioning as well. First of all, I find it fascinating that Watchtower has gone to such extraordinary lengths when it comes to casting people for their propaganda films. They've cast thousands of people, presumably for only, I don't know, a few hundred roles. I don't know how many roles it would be, but surely not everyone made the cut. So you're watching... <laughs> If you're watching some of those terrible performances that we've seen in recent years in dramas and in dramatizations that Watchtower's produced, and you see this just really wooden, appalling, unconvincing acting, you have to bear in mind that this was probably the best <laughs> of maybe dozens of other individuals who were auditioned for the role and they've been through acting classes and this is still the standard that we're getting in the propaganda that Watchtower produces and he also tells this story about Mary and I, I think that there's lots of things in this story that seem to be being left out I'm pretty sure that you would only get a call from a producer or a casting director if you've put your name forward. I'm pretty sure that <laughs> casting directors or producers don't just ring any old person. Oh, Lloyd, would you like to be in the next Tom Cruise film? Hmm, I think I'll give that some thought. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that you have to put your name forward or go to some effort, I would suggest, to even make it to the stage where that phone call becomes possible. So what exactly was Mary doing to even get to this stage, all of that gets glossed over because she made the right decision to instead participate in this JW uh, dramatization that apparently would have conflicted with the worldly production. So lots of unanswered questions there. While AVS production uh, with the videos is on the rise, um, which committee in particular is making use of videos more than the rest? Teaching committee. In fact, if you look at the chart that uh, will be portrayed here, <laughs> teaching committee is the largest requester of videos. And uh, recently in the teaching committee report delivered by Brother Tim Faglinski, which he did an awesome job, represented us well, we heard that during 2016, a total of 356 videos were produced. And he said on the average, that's about one video a day. That's amazing, going from small beginnings uh, to what we see today. And of these 356 videos, 310 were commissioned by the teaching committee. So by far, uh, you know who is your boss. <laughs> teaching committee loves videos, but all the other committees are coming on board. They see the value that it's reaching minds and hearts. The writing committee, of course, uh, has many, and the service committee, and so forth. 
the next diagram is a very detailed chart. Um, of the 356 videos, 44 percent or specifically 156 videos were made for JW Broadcasting alone. So every month, it's amazing what you are able to produce for the teaching committee and JW Broadcast. Also, 19% or 67 pieces were made for the 2016 regional conventions. And the brothers and sisters that have attended the conventions were saying it was the best convention ever. We're, we're looking forward to 2017 for them to say the exact same thing, the best convention ever. I love the fact that Watchtower is here patting itself on the back over the 2016 Remain Loyal to Jehovah Convention and they're calling it the best convention ever when my series of rebuttals for that convention was titled The Worst Convention Ever because it was, in my opinion, when you look at the incredibly coercive doomsday material that witnesses were exposed to during that convention. It was truly appalling, and yet here they are saying, oh yeah, that was the best one. <laughs> and you also have these fascinating pie charts. Why don't ordinary witnesses get to see this would be my question. But you have here the pie chart that reveals that 44% of the videos produced are for JW Broadcasting. Again, their televangelist arm. And 20% was for the convention, the 2016 convention uh, in this particular year. So I'd be interested to see whether those segments, those numbers have shifted um, more recently. But this is a good indication, um, interesting information to help us get a picture of how these resources are used and what sort of content Watchtower is most focused on. And of course, a big project for 2016 was the move out, renovation, and move back into this facility, Mount Ebo. A little history on Mount Ebo. This facility was purchased in February 26, 2015. The renovation began in May of 2016 and it was finished in December. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not physically uh, here, uh, we're going to give you some dimensions. Now these are going to be in feet. You'll have to do your own calculations. Use Google. Um, but stage one and two, which are the smaller ones, they're 70 feet by 70 feet. So they're bigger than stage one at Patterson. So we have two of those, and we have one large studio right here. So it's 284 feet from north to south, and 127.7 feet long from east to west. And it's 32 feet high. So we have a lot of space uh, to make videos. And for you trivia buffs, did you wonder where we got the name Mount Ebo? Is that something that we came up with? Well, the building is physically located on 39 Mount Ebo Road South. However, if you follow Mount Ebo Road North, it goes uphill to Mount Ebo. So we didn't come up with it. It was already uh, this tech park. That's what they used. So we're using that name. I'm hoping you caught the irony of the part where Ron says, use Google. Oh, don't use Google to critically analyze and scrutinize your beliefs but you can use it to do a conversion but yeah this is again interesting in the context of what we're talking about this slide into televangelism and here they are giving this behind the scenes kind of behind closed doors meeting where they're talking about their mount ebo complex which became you could say operational late 2016 early 2017 and this is the complex where they will be shooting a huge bulk of their video propaganda presumably right up to 2026 when the Ramapo facilities become operational so it's useful to again look at this material to get a feel for where Watchtower is going with all of this. So the teaching committee, the governing body, and all of us, we want to be faithful and discreet to the faithful and discreet. And so we're always looking at ways to work harder, 
more efficient, and to save dedicated funds where we can. We appreciate that you are doing this as well. So what do we have planned going forward? Well, we have DR18. That's the drama for 2018. That's already begun. We've already been using these studios to begin. Uh, there's a team that's moving out to California to begin some filming in California. We have another team in the future that will be going to Louisiana, making use of a facility to film part of that uh, huge production down there. So we appreciate that the funds are being used in a, in a wise way to make uh, a drama that would be touching and educational as well. We want to be faithful and discreet too the faithful and discreet. This is the kind of power that the governing body has over Bethelites, and this is the sort of mentality that you need to have as a Bethelite. And we're also given a hint as to how much money all of this costs. I mean, you look at how big Mount Ebo is, you imagine how much money goes into the equipment they have there, the props, all of the effects that they use, and they're talking here about going to other locations to shoot for the drama of 2018, which was the um, Job, no, not the Job, the Jonah drama, uh, which I've covered on the channel. All of which is money that's being, money and resources that are being expended purely to keep witnesses docile, keep witnesses indoctrinated. And again, we're going to see more of an admission in that direction as this video continues. So, Brother Ken, 20 years ago, I know you've had many assignments throughout the years at Bethel, but the, the brothers decided that you would become an audio-video overseer. What was it like when you received that new assignment? Okay, well, um, it was uh, January 3rd, 1997, so just a little over 20 years ago. and. Uh, I was working at my desk and writing correspondence, and Brother Barry of the Governing Body came in, and he said, we're merging the audio department with the video department. They were separate. And he said, you're going to be the overseer of the merged de department. So I thought this was mission impossible. And one of the reasons is, I wear hearing aids, and I'm going to be overseer of audio. And when I was growing up, Dad never let us kids watch any TV, and I'm going to be the overseer of video. This didn't make sense. But I have to say that that merge was not smooth, because there was technology used by both of them, different technology. They were married to their own technology, and to try to get them to come together, um, each one of the departments thought the other was an apostate. <laughs> So it was very difficult, very stressful. I, I still say, even though I'm now working with teaching, that was the most stressful year of my life. Teaching is a charm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a fascinating testimony from Ken Flodine. Again, we're hearing things that ordinary Jehovah's Witnesses would never hear. You would never get that kind of admission from a governing body helper on a JW broadcasting episode because again they have a narrative they want that they want to put across they have an agenda they want to present the organization as harmonious as united as working together seamlessly oh yes we all work together and everything's perfect it's just wonderful and here you have Ken Flodine saying that in 1997 he was tasked with bringing together the audio um, department and the video department and there was friction to the extent where, and I've never heard the word apostate used in such a, I don't know, flippant manner by uh, a senior Watchtower official, they viewed each other as apostates. And they're almost joking about how how the organization looks down on apostates. Just astonishing. But amazingly, it gets even more interesting. But uh, there, I remember one meeting, and uh, brothers from the, both sides, they were arguing their point, and they got so riled up, one actually reached up and went like this over the table, mm -hmm. and I had to stop them. I said, no, we don't do that. We're Christians. And so... Uh, 
I was just thinking of all that's gone on here with so many people, so many projects moving, and on top of that, a total reorganization of the whole department. Tight and, schedules, the whole thing. Yeah. And so I just imagine, even though you paint smiles on your faces, that it's not been easy for everyone. And for many, it's been quite painful. And so uh, it just harkens back to that, that merge and how we handled it. Just, just incredible aggression. Aggression at an internal meeting because the audio people and the video people weren't getting on to the point where someone was so animated and aggressive that they were waving their fist or gesticulating in a in an aggressive way in this meeting in Jehovah's house uh, which is how Jehovah's witnesses will view it you don't hear about this in the literature or on JW broadcasting again the in, the exact opposite image is put across as though there could be no friction like this at the apex of the organization and it's deliberately withheld this sort of information from the rank and file because if they were to find out about this sort of thing or if it were to be common knowledge suddenly you you are confronted by the awkward question well doesn't this sound like pretty much any organization if there can be that level of aggression in a in a meeting at Bethel, at, at the audio video services department, basically at the, the at the apex of the organization, if there's that sort of aggression going on, what's special about the organization? How is this Jehovah's spirit directed organization where everyone works in unity? And if there can be aggression in that one meeting that we're hearing about, because Ken Flodine is suddenly feeling all transparent in front of his friends, what aggression goes on elsewhere in Bethel that we will never hear about. I had another question for you. Uh, what many families are enjoying and young people are the animated series, Caleb and Sophia. Uh, it'd be kind of interesting to know the history of that. How did that start? Uh, there's a little bit of a backstory on that one. Um, probably now it's been maybe uh, 17 years ago. Um, we had done the Noah video with artwork but it didn't move much, and we are doing the David, and I approached the teaching committee at the time, which was a totally different teaching committee, totally different governing body, and said, wouldn't it be nice to do animated videos for children? And at the time, they said no, because they didn't want to take the dignity of the message of God's word and reduce it to cartoons. Well, that's the faithful slave, and so I never said another word. But uh, about maybe 15 years after that or 13 years after that, I asked to come down to Brooklyn. And one of the first things Brother Morris came up to me and said was that the governing body has approved animated videos for children. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. But the timing wasn't right back then. And probably the technology wasn't right back then. But now that was approved. And so I was just thrilled. But then he said, and we want it released at this next convention in as many languages as possible. And so I was like, whoa. So uh, as always, ABS steps up to the plate, makes it commission possible. And so uh, just to tell you what happened, that little crew, they had done animation, moving the world around, making Bibles flow. But to do the human form is the most difficult. And so they got on the tools. But to, we have very difficult, hard due dates. And to make some of those dates, the brothers worked 30 hours straight on their computer. And we finally brought beds up into the department so that they could take a two or three hour nap and get back on their computer to finish it up. So it was just a, a beautiful thing. And look what it's done for the world. And they don't have that problem now. They got more help, but also we don't have to get seven languages on one DVD now. So that's what was the uh, kind of choke point on that one. Well, thanks for sharing that, and we appreciate all of your years of making what was impossible possible by means of Jehovah. What's being described here is unmistakably a man-made organization, just like any other. And Ken Flodine can't see that 
because by the sounds of things he had a very strict upbringing to begin with he described earlier not being allowed to watch television as a youngster presumably i don't know his full story but presumably as a jehovah's witness child that was the sort of upbringing he had he's now at the center of the organization almost having devoted his career to the organization and he's so blinkered that even though he's describing this distinctly human organization where decisions get made depending on who happens to be on the governing body he even says oh it was a different governing body and that was the faithful slave so i wasn't allowed to say anything one minute this sort of thing is damaging the dignity of god's message and then a few governing body members die and get replaced by a few other governing body members and hey presto oh actually we've decided cartoons that indoctrinate children um, into thinking that a warrior wizard toy needs to be put in the dumpster totally fine that's the organization that we're dealing with and am i the only one who's a bit concerned by these confessions about bethelites working what was it 30 hours did he say <laughs> oh we had to bring beds because they were working 30 hours straight to produce become jehovah's friend so i'm, I'm looking at this now thinking basically it's the product of slave labor i mean these are unpaid volunteers you're not giving them any real salary they're they're bethelites and you're making them work ridiculous hours at the cost of their health you could say to produce this again just an entirely man-made organization where is the organization where is the sensitivity to people's individual needs where is the planning if you're making people work 30-hour shifts to produce this sort of thing after that wonderful interview and a lot of stats and statistics you want some spiritual food you want some real meat well we have brother let prepared for us that will give us uh i don't have a theme but he's probably going to give you his theme and we look forward to your talk brother let so I don't think it'll be meat, but maybe a little cheese. <laughs> Just to start off, um, I would really, again, like to say that the teaching committee truly appreciates what all of you are doing, the challenges um, you face, but you overcome it with Jehovah's help and working together in unity unlike the days of Brother Flodeen. <laughs> but we really appreciate it, and you, you can be sure Jehovah deeply appreciates. That's one thing about Jehovah. You know, people in the world, you can work your heart out to some company, and uh, they just dismiss you, and there's really no appreciation. But Jehovah, what you do for him, he really appreciates it. And uh, we try to reflect that appreciation, the teaching committee, and the whole governing body really appreciates what you're doing because you're having a powerful effect on Jehovah's people. And I was just thinking that Jehovah doesn't want any of these sheep to be lost. See, he wants his people to make it into the new world. And Satan is, is more busy than ever the times are more critical, there, there's more uh, distractions, there's more difficulties, but Jehovah has speeded up the work of feeding his people and really touching their hearts and helping them because Jehovah doesn't want any of his sheep to go where Satan's going. See, Satan's headed for the lake of fire, isn't he? That's his destination, but that's not our destination. Our destination is the new world. And Jehovah wants us to make the right destination. And uh, what you're doing is helping many. In fact, on assignments I, I go on, 
and people will say I was right at the point, I was ready to give up, and I just didn't know if I could make it. And then I looked at the broadcast, and it helped me so much, now I'm able to go. See, it, it's saving lives. There's no doubt about it. So thank you very much. Okay, lots to process there. First things first, I hope you'll notice that Stephen Letts has a different tone when he's talking to his co-workers, his colleagues, his fellow Bethelites, than when he is on JW Broadcasting or when he is on the convention platform. It's interesting that as he settles into his dialogue, he starts to slip more into the slightly kind of cheesy, he admitted himself, mannerisms that he has. But I don't know, he's, to me, he's just even a little bit of an octave lower in, in just being a bit more down to earth, a bit more real, again, when he's addressing his fellow Bethelites. But as far as the substance of what he's saying, isn't it interesting, going back to what I was saying right at the beginning, addressing this slide into televangelism, talking about what was said by the spokesman about Ramapo. Oh, well, we're doing this due to a huge demand from outsiders. This is all about this. I'm not going to give you any facts or figures. You're just going to have to take my word for it. But boy, do people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses need our videos. So that's why we're making this massive new complex nonsense. Absolute nonsense. This is all about keeping people subservient, docile, compliant, indoctrinated. And Stephen let as much as admits that here. This is Satan's world that we're living in. And if, if people uh, go astray, if people don't end up being like us, if people don't, be, don't stay as Jehovah's Witnesses, they are destined for the lake of fire. I kid you not, that's what he said. If you're not a Jehovah's Witness, if you're not on the train to salvation with us, lake of fire for you, along with Satan. That's, that's the thinking that goes on in this man's head. That's the thinking that informs the propaganda material that this man prepares. And rather than being a service that is being rendered to outsiders, this is all about consolidating people who are waking up and realising that they're being lied to, trying to stop that as much as possible with the tear jerkers, with the emotional manipulation, with the heart tugging testimonies. We want to appeal to people's emotions. That's why we need JW Broadcasting to stop people leaving. In Matthew 22, just turn over a little bit and begin in verse 19. Here Jesus, who's been taught by Jehovah and just like Jehovah, he tells him now, show me the tax coin. They brought him a denarius. He said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, pay back therefore Caesar's thanks to Caesar, but God's thanks to God. Again, a visual aid, see, to really make the point. Now, you can be sure that if they would have had the technology like we have today, back in Jesus' time, he, he would have used that. But we have it, don't we? And Jehovah is using uh, what is available and, and uh, even more so speeding up the work because of the, the critical times to help his people. And uh, we're using wisely this technology. So what I've just shown you is just the final minute of a rather tedious bit of Bible quoting that Stephen Lett does. He's essentially trying to use the Bible to justify the slide into televangelism. He starts off by saying that uh, Jehovah instructs people by using word images. So if there's a Bible text where Jehovah is describing something using a word picture, then that's basically Jehovah using his version of video 
or his version of television. I don't know. That's essentially the argument that Stephen Lett was making. And now he then he moves to Jesus and says, oh, Jesus was just the same. He used the coin of the... Um, the coin showing the denarius sorry showing Caesar and says you need to pay Caesar's things to Caesar that's pretty much the same as getting in front of a camera (laughs) I kid you not that's his logic that's the way they are that's the way the governing body of here 2017 is justifying the fact that they are now using this technology on an unprecedented scale. He even says, well, if Jesus were here, he would be utilising this technology. Absolutely astonishing. Literally putting words into the mouth of Jesus. That's not remotely what this passage says. You're just trying to make excuses for the fact that you are doing things entirely differently to the way you did them just a few years ago when Ken Flodeen has told us that a previous governing body, because apparently there can be multiple governing bodies depending on which year you happen to be talking about, oh, a different governing body felt that it removed the dignity of the message. Oh, well, this governing body says, no, no worries about that. No, it doesn't remove the dignity of the message. And actually, here's a verse where Jesus asks to see a coin, which must be referring to video technology. And we could talk all day about the powerful effect it is having on Jehovah's people. But I have just three little examples. I know you've read many, but to me, it really touched my heart. And then it makes me think when you you get these kind of letters that we're doing the right thing. Jehovah's with us. This is Jehovah's work. But um, I want to read you a little letter here that the governing body got from a um, first a 10-year-old, then a 14-year-old, then an adult. Now, here's the little 10-year-old. Dear governing body, my name is Farah, and I am 10 years old and live in Northern Ireland. Firstly, I would like to thank you for the Caleb and Sophia videos especially for Jehovah will help you be bold. This video helped me to stand up for my faith in school. I have a few challenges already. Uh, Ten years old, but I got a few challenges already. And I would like to tell you, though, about one. I went into my classroom one morning, and my teacher told the class it was his birthday. And then he said, I'm going to call out your names one by one, and you have to say, Happy birthday, sir. I watched nervously as my classmates said, Happy birthday, and then it was my turn. I felt a bit scared, and everyone was looking at me. The teacher said, Good morning, Farah. I replied, Good morning, sir. Then he kept looking at me and said, What do you have to say to me? I replied, I do not participate in birthdays. Afterwards, I felt proud of myself and that Jehovah was proud of me too. Thank you for making these videos and thinking of us children. Love, Farah. So it really touches your heart when you these videos are are just... um, touching their heart, empowering them, allowing them to handle these challenges. And it is amazing how many challenges are young ones. I, I think about when I was in school, and I thought it was bad in school, but it's nothing like today. You send your children off to school, it's like sending them off to the battlefield. But uh, Jehovah is equipping them, see, with these things. He's using you like a tool in his hand to equip Jehovah's people. And thinking of us children. That's the message from Farah. She thinks that Stephen Lett is thinking of the children when Watchtower are coming up with their appalling policies to do with child safeguarding. It really is sickening when you think of it, but here Stephen Lett is delighting in the grip that he has on a young mind. 
using uh, a letter that describes a very odd experience. I mean, how many teachers are narcissistic enough to, in <laughs> to insist that they go around the whole class and hear from each and every student, happy birthday, sir? How many teachers are narcissistic enough to demand that from their students and yet they pluck this this random experience and say ha that's what we're up against that's satan's world for you it's a battlefield this is normal out there bethelites that's why we need you as a tool interesting word that isn't it we we're using you as a tool a tool that we might demand 30 hour shifts from if necessary so that we can continue to pump out this content that is keeping little girls like Farah convinced that they that they need to take a stand and refuse to say happy birthday or that they need to feel threatened in those sorts of situations and view them as a make or break test of loyalty. But now here's one from the 14 year old. Hi. My name is Angie. I am 14 years old, and I live in, in some town here I can't pronounce, <laughs> South Africa. I want to say a big thank you for the monthly broadcasts. From the first day of each uh, new month, we check regularly to see if it's come out. Then as soon as it does, we watch it together as a family. We never miss a single one. The broadcasts are the spiritual highlight of the month for us. What's really special is that we're getting to know the governing body members personally, even though we've never met most of them. For me, it was kind of like they were up on a high rank. But now I can see that they're just like all other humans. <laughs> it's good. That's very good. <laughs> and they have our best interest at heart. One of the highlights of the monthly broadcast for me is the music videos. It's so lovely that the organization has taken a personal interest in teenagers and has given us spiritual music to enjoy. I can really feel the love Jehovah has for us reflected in his organization. I sometimes find myself humming the words of the new songs. Please keep up the good work in the music department. Okay, Brother uh, Baker, you heard that, right? Keep up the good work. And Ted Adams and all you others work in there with the music. Also, the new songs that have been added to our songbook have such a nice beat. The orchestral music is really awesome. My favorites are Grant Us Boldness and Preach to All Sorts of People, although I love all the new songs. The music makes me feel uplifted because of the lovely words and melody. Thank you to all those who are involved in providing those spiritual feasts. May Jehovah continue to bless you and keep you with his chariot that is constantly moving at the speed of lightning with warm Christian love from Angela Gibson. So again, 14 years old. I mean, it's amazing even how she expressed herself. And uh, Jehovah is educating our young ones right from infancy. Jehovah is educating our young ones right from infancy. He's really into that, isn't he, Stephen Lett? So many items of his or speeches that he's given on JW Broadcasting have been aimed at young ones and making sure he gets to control them, making sure he gets to influence the course they take in life, influence them away from higher education and influence them toward effectively serving him or serving whoever follows him in whatever the next governing body ends up being. They change all the time, as we've just heard. But what a fascinating glimpse. I don't know whether it's just me, 
But when he read that those comments about, oh, we could see you're just human, there was just a a slight kind of microsecond where you see this this glint in his eyes, this kind of smugness, and you think, yeah, you're loving that, aren't you? You're loving the power that you have, and the and the way that these people around the world are looking up to you and you're loving the thought that someone is seeing you as human when really you view yourself as one day riding around on a heavenly horse in the armies among the armies of Jesus annihilating those at Armageddon who don't want to follow you that's how human you are, as we've learned in, as I've mentioned in previous videos about the governing body's belief that they will go up to heaven just before Armageddon so that they can participate in the slaughter. That's how human Stephen Lett is. And that's why there's a glint in his eye and a chuckle, a wry chuckle, as he reads that particular part of the letter. But here's one more, and something that maybe you don't think it has that much of an effect. It was talked about a little bit earlier by Brother Curzan and about the captions. But uh, this brother, I thought it was, it was quite touching. He says, Brothers, my wife and I want to thank you so much for making the majority of the broadcast segments available now with closed captions. Before... My wife, who has been hearing impaired from birth, would be able to get less than 25% of the programs. Anytime foreign language brothers spoke in English or an English voiceover was done with original language and background, all that was unintelligible to her. Sadly, even some of the governing body's words were unclear. Probably some of my words. The new provision of closed caption eliminates those problems and is a real blessing from Jehovah. It truly enables one to now fully hear what his spirit is saying to the congregation, Revelation 2.11. To see the joy on her face now each time she watches a program and understands its entirety is so heartwarming. Until the new order's change comes in hearing for the deaf and hearing impaired, Isaiah 35, 5. This technology is the breath of fresh air these ones needed. We recognize it came at the expense of the society's time and limited resources, and we will share our valuable things in appreciation. Thank you again for providing for this hidden yet sizable number of God's people. So again, from the very small to the adults to ones that even have special needs, Jehovah is providing, and you're just a tool in his hand. It's Jehovah's work. That's what we always say as a governing body, that it's, it's not our work. We're just a tool in Jehovah's hand, and we just want to be a good tool. And I know you want to be the same. You want to be a good tool in Jehovah's hand, whatever assignment you have. And uh, Jehovah will continue to use you. And truly, lives are at stake. Lives are being saved by what you're doing. So keep up the good work. We love you all very much. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, if there's one thing I can agree on in everything that we've just heard from Stephen Letts, it's that he's a tool. I definitely agree with that. But gosh, you, you've heard it again. Lives are at stake. That's how he started off, if you remember. We want to save Jehovah's Witnesses from the lake of fire. By the way, that's not a reference to hell. That they Jehovah's Witnesses think of the lake of fire as signifying eternal destruction. That's where Satan's going. And at the beginning, Stephen, let's say, is, well, the work that we're doing here at Mount Ebo is going to stop people from being destroyed. 
because if they don't become Jehovah's Witnesses or stay as Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to be destroyed. And he references that again towards the end and says lives are being saved, lives are in the balance. Amazing that I still get people coming on my channel trying to argue that it's not as dogmatic as that, that Jehovah's Witnesses don't teach, that you're doomed to annihilation if you don't agree with them. That's exactly the message. That's exactly the thinking that this propaganda endorses, that this propaganda points towards. And in my view, rather than being an attractive proposition to outsiders, rather than being something that will appeal to anyone from any religious background, this is intended to keep witnesses trapped. Even though when you watch JW Broadcasting, you might be thinking, come on, how is this remotely compelling? This is just plain silly. How can anyone take this seriously? This must be turning Jehovah's Witnesses away in droves when they see how overtly manipulative their leaders are and how human they are and how goofy they are. People like Stephen Lett. How can anyone take this seriously? Witnesses do take it seriously. I've sat in Kingdom Halls when the videos from JW Broadcasting have popped up on the TV screens and I've looked around the room. No one is laughing. No one is thinking, oh, these morons again. They all take it seriously. And that's, that's why they're making these videos. That's why Watchtower has made this slide into televangelism. It's not about reaching everyone. The, the episodes are not for the mass market. The episodes are not written in a way that's intended to appeal to anyone. The episodes are very clearly written for JWs because that's who they're trying to reach. And if they can keep witnesses in this box, in this echo chamber, then they're in with a shot of stopping them from ever questioning their beliefs, ever even thinking about what might be on the other side. That's what it's all about. That's why they've given so much ground and capitulated so much when it comes to the lure of video and visual media. But that's pretty much everything that I had to share with you. I hope you've found the leaked uh, video interesting. I'm sorry I've not shared it earlier. I could have done, but I think that in the context of the Ramapo news, it's probably more relevant. And if it's more relevant, then maybe more people will watch the video and talk about it. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.